these very natural bionic looking designs uh, that are like organic shapes, very flowing shapes. And um, often this is also connected to additive manufacturing. Um, you have to upskill people. Um, you have to teach them how to code. It's also very technology dependent. So uh, you have to have a platform that allows you to do all that. And um, for example, some of the tools in generative design in connected engineering are more flexible than others. And that means I have to think a lot differently. Like Mike said, the mindset shift. My mindset needs to shift to from, uh, can I do this small part of the design or how thick is this? You think about what are the things driving my design and how can I implement them into one yeah, algorithm that drives this design in the end. All right, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of the Connected Engineering Podcast. My guest today, Daniel Löwen. Welcome to the show. Hi, Yusuf. Glad to be here. Amazing. So today we'll talk about generative design, which I think is a very broad term. A lot of people use it in the wrong way, I would say. So today we want to kind of explain what generative design means, what is this all about, what are the advantages, maybe also disadvantages of using these methods um, that exist out there. But before we jump into the nitty gritty, who is Daniel in the first place and what is your background and what are you doing at Sonero? Well, who I am, uh, I'm an engineer by training. I studied computational engineering science at the RWTH Aachen, um, which is a relatively new field of study where they took maths, computer science, mechanical engineering, and just make, uh, made a concoction out of that. And the goal of that was um, educating engineers to be able to develop new algorithms, new methods for use cases in mechanical engineering. And that then are also able to implement those. So um, to do basically the whole thing. And yeah, after my studies, I joined uh, Mercedes-Benz for a few years. And uh, later I joined Sonera, a tech company that works on making process automation for engineering applications and works on making that as fast and easy as possible. And I am now the business operations lead there. Amazing. We'll talk about Scenario in a little bit more detail uh, later in this podcast. How did you even start coming up with the idea to maybe get into generative engineering in the first place? Because I think you wrote your thesis on generative yes. engineering or design. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a German, I like to be efficient and uh, optimize stuff. So I don't know. Uh, somehow it always um, was my thinking during my studies of how do I get to better products or how do I get to these products in an efficient way? And I was also always very interested in product development and design in all of these aspects. So I chose to um, yeah, pick a lot of modules in this direction during my master's uh, and yeah, did some design modules, some product development modules. And my master thesis, I wrote about um, yeah, a comparison study of generative design and topology optimization. And in that, I compared these two they're not directly comparable because uh, for me, topology optimization is a method inside of generative design. So generative design is more the umbrella term, but um, I, I nonetheless worked on uh, a comparison study and tried to find out um, what is it that distinguishes those and what are even generative design aspects? Because as, as a field, it's been relatively uncovered um, in academia and you don't find many papers about this. And um, yeah, it's more driven by a few companies in the field that try to establish these. So I was always intrigued by what these companies did and um, then had to combine this, that with the academic side of writing a master thesis about that. Yeah, I think a lot of people, as you said, Daniel, have the misconception of topology optimization being generative design per definition. What was generative design in the first place, like from its pure like high level perspective, maybe a broad yeah. definition? I would say in, in a very like high level definition, generative design describes or is a method where algorithms are used to explore a high number of design possibilities. And these algorithms can be very simple, very rule-based and just create thousands of designs that you then evaluate, or they can be very advanced AI methods of some sort. But yeah, it's algorithm, algorithms used to create and then to evaluate high numbers of design possibilities. Mm -hmm. I think that's a super cool definition. Um, what are some of the algorithms that you have tried yourself and how much of today's generative design AI is actually AI? Like, do you know some of the stuff that's going on behind the scenes? It's, I would say, um, 
so I myself used evolutionary algorith algorithms in my uh, development of the uh, generative design study that I um, implemented in my master's thesis. And I know that some people are even calling uh, evolutionary algorithms AI algorithms and uh, make this into one thing. Um, not sure about this. Typically, AI applications um, are based on um, algorithms like mach machine learning, um, stuff like this. In generative design, I don't see a broad usage of these things yet. Um, what I do see are, for example, evolutionary algorithms, which I also implemented in my studies, uh, in my uh, master thesis, uh, where you have a set of parameters that are driving the design, and then you randomly implement mutations for these parameters. So these parameters take random values. And through this randomization of these values, you get all the design possibilities. And then you implement, for example, heuristics to find the optimal design, to not only have mutations and designs all over the place, but to be able to evaluate and come to an optimal design at some point. Mm -hmm. What was your use case in your master thesis? So how, did you, how do you, for example, maybe let's jump a little bit deeper into it. Like, how do you create these permutations in the first place? What do you know? What is feasible for an engineer? What is manufacturable at the end of the day? All these kind of things. So what do you have to mm -hmm. think about? Um, for me, uh, what you have to think about is um, if we start very broad, um, how do I define what product I want to develop? In my case, um, it was the stock of a biathlon uh, athlete's rifle. Uh, mm -hmm. That was the use case that I looked at. So I had to define what are the parameters that I have to take into account to design actually something like this. So a product very high level is a one of the thousands of possible solutions, and it comes into existence by many people taking hundreds or thousands of decisions throughout a process. And uh, that uh, can be higher or lower depending on complexity. And let's say in the beginning, you want to develop a new pro uh, product, so for example, this uh, biathlon stock. Um, so I start with what are my goals? Okay, very clear, uh, some geometrical form for this um, rifle. And then mm -hmm. I uh, talk about the constraints and specifications and, and try to find out what in this sport will drive my design. So um, the different uh, things that the athletes do, uh, the material parameters, my manufacturing methods. So all of these uh, things, they drive my design. And um, normally in conventional methods, you have a process that tries to be very structured and lead you through all of these decisions until you reach the product in the end. And each decision that you take has a more or less high impact on the design downstream. Because if I choose a product, uh, a material at the beginning, it will impact manufacturability, it will impact cost and so on, um, as well as other things like rel reliability for the biathlon, biathlon use case, for example. So um, instead of following all of these, I approached this through generative design on the one hand and through topology optimization on the other hand. So topology optimization takes a design space and, finds to op uh, and tries to find the optimal structure uh, based on some criteria um, inside of this design sp space. So what you can see in the end are these very natural bionic looking designs uh, that are like organic shapes, very flowing shapes. And um, often this is also connected to additive manufacturing. Um, on the other hand, with generative design and evolutionary algorithms, I had to find a structure that kind of, or an algorithm that kind of gives me the same thing. So how do I find an optimal form in a design space? And there I went to lattice structures and to yeah, um, the um, stress-driven analysis of lattice structures um, where I have certain parameters that drive the lattice. And these parameters in the evolutionary algorithms, like the size of the lattice structure, the thickness of the beams and so on, these were driven by the al evolutionary algorithm. So these were randomly mu mutated to different values um, and then in the end optimized and evaluated. That makes sense. Um... When we think about the terms like all the limitations of generative design, what I think about is always like this Gartner hype cycle, where at the mm -hmm. beginning you have kind of a peak of excitement and there's, there's valley of despair, and then at some point there's a kind of a plateau. So what do you think is one of the biggest misconceptions people think generative design can do for them? And they're just overestimated. Yes. Yeah, especially uh, I would say in the last year, where we have seen a lot of generative AI, which uh, like uh, already shares much of the name, um, and there, in people's minds, it's really the, I can ask any question and I will get an answer. 
-hmm. This is not the case with generative design. Generative design is not some very magic solution that requires very clear input parameters and then very clear constraints. And they are driving a very clear algorithm. And that algorithm is then creating a product or a design in the end that I can evaluate. So it's, it needs to have very structured input parameters, very structured uh, algorithms behind it. Um, at least that's the status quo in technology today. And it's also, um, you always compare AI things and human creativity. It's not a replacement for that. As I'm implementing a certain algorithm to drive my design, it's limited to what I have implemented. So I can augment it and uh, change something in the algorithm, but in the end, it will always, the same input parameters will always lead to the same output. Um, and judging and evaluating this output, that still needs uh, a lot of human impact or a, a lot of human expertise. Yeah, I like that you mentioned it, Daniel, because I've talked to a lot of experts in the in the recent uh, months or years, actually, and everyone says it's more like a productivity tool that you have to think about, yeah. not like an, a substitution, which kind of also brings us maybe later on to the topic of low code. Everyone thinks, well, if I put my knowledge into the system, then I'm kind of becoming redundant, etc. So mm -hmm. probably that's not the case. It's more like an augmentation of our own intelligence and become more productive. Yeah, it, uh, to be honest, it will take at least some uh, jobs theoretically, because um, uh, it will change the way that uh, engineers and designers work, because you mm -hmm. can be faster and more efficient through using generative design and these algorithms in coming up with your uh, design or product development tasks. Um, and it, that will require that you yeah, change your skill set. And um, yeah, uh, that also means that maybe some people who don't want to change their skill sets uh, will not make the jump to the new um, yeah, era of product engineering. That if is I true. can be very bold. <laughs> yeah, that is true though. So maybe let us stay a second uh, at the topic of product development processes that you've mentioned, Daniel. What do you, or what can engineers expect in terms of KPIs, maybe time savings, money savings, when they talk about the product development itself at the current stage, and then also implementing things like generative AI, generative design, and other uh, advanced methods? Mm -hmm. So in product uh, development, as it is conventionally done, you follow these uh, series of steps. And in this series of steps, you often have different people working and you have different um, tools that these uh, people are using. You have the interfaces in between these people. And um, generative design often covers more than one of these steps. So what the result is of instead of having a designer doing the design, the simulation engineer doing the simulation, manufacturing engineer doing the manufacturing, you have mm -hmm. something that an algorithm that covers all three of those, for example. What generative design can do here is it can bridge all of these steps and mm -hmm. through bridging it, through eliminating the interfaces between, for example, CAD, CAE, and CM, it re reduces the need of iterations and it uh, gives you through that, a much faster development. So the um, big advantages here are really the speed that you can develop uh, with. And at the same time, um, you can get to better um, better results because you can cover a more, much, much higher number of um, yeah, options in the design space, in the solution space. Yeah. Uh, interesting point that you mentioned, that, uh, Daniel, because to Mike in the last podcast, I've talked about kind of the mindset shift that engineers have to go through. I want to talk about two things, maybe, Daniel, which is one, how does the engineer have to change not only from a skill perspective, but also from a mind shift perspective? And two, how will the information flow change in the future? Because as you said, kind of these, these strict borders will vanish. It's more like a flowing between different departments. So how will the communication of the future look like between engineers? Mm -hmm. So... The first question uh, was the working style. Mm -hmm. So the working style changes a lot because instead of having the task of create this one product, um, let's say an example from Sonera's customers is a company that defines uh, that builds satellites. So they get requirements from a customer and uh, have to come up with a satellite design. Mm -hmm. What the working style was before is, oh, I have these requirements. So an engineer sits down and do, does a design, gives this design to the simulation engineer. It gets simulated. Is it strong enough? Um, can I save some weight somewhere? All of these questions. And then it needs to be manufactured. So it goes to the manufacturing engineer. And mm -hmm. when it's finished, it's produced and sent to the customer. 
So this is a, a, the very um, yeah, conventional way. So the people in there had their very limited task of, I create the design, I do the simulation, I do the, do the manufacturing preparation, and they do it on this specific use case. In the future, you don't do that. In the future, you define, how do I get to the design? How do I get to the simulation? How do I get to see and optimize for manufacturability? So you define the process instead of the part itself. You mm -hmm. don't work the same task for each product. You work on the process that creates this part. And that doesn't matter uh, what the requirements are. They can change. In the end, the process is the same. So I really am working on the process itself. And that means I have to think a lot differently. Like Mike said, the mindset shift. My mindset needs to shift to from, uh, can I do this small part of the design or how thick is this? You think about what are the things driving my design and how can I implement them into one yeah, algorithm that drives this design in the end. Yeah. So basically what you said, Daniel, that makes a lot of sense. So basically the, the tricky part is now taking from what you've said, kind of operationalizing software. This is kind of the yeah. tricky part. So how does software has to change now to kind of put this into practice? It needs to give you a lot of, well, how does software need to change? Uh, it needs to give you the um, possibility to build these solutions and to build these algorithms. And you can do that, of course, right now. You can just sit down and uh, use Python and uh, implement your algorithms yourself how you mm -hmm. want to. There are different tools available um, that do generative design. Um, but in the end, you need some way to define your goals, to define your input parameters, to define the process, the algorithm, to be able to evaluate the solutions that you have and choose an optimal design, and then if necessary, iterate or uh, integrate other requirements. So software needs to be very flexible to do that because it matters very much if it's a satellite that I uh, design, or if it's, uh, I don't know, a whole car or just a, a Biathlon rifle stock or whatever. So uh, it needs to be very flexible and adaptable to my um, yeah, constraints or requirements that I have. Yeah, instead of using high code, things like, a, I don't know, C Sharp, Python, whatever yeah. you want to use versus low code, like having building blocks, like everyone knows this kind of things like Simulink, for example. What is the big advantage of using something like a low code environment to actually put this into practice again? It uh, reduces the time that you need um, to come up with all of these uh, things like the process, because instead of writing each line of code, I just write uh, or just drop a low code note on my canvas um, that already includes a certain number of lines. And then I just uh, combine it. So it makes the whole development effort lower and makes it faster to come up with these solutions. Yeah. So then at the end of the day, what is connected engineering in the first place? Because this is the name of the podcast, mm -hmm. right? Connected engineering. So what yeah. is in the first place and how will it actually, going back to the landscape of engineers, how will it change the, the way engineers work? So mm -hmm. I talked about these steps in the product development process and the different tools involved, the different people involved. And mm -hmm. what Connected Engineering does is it connects all of these different tools. And that, thus, with the work, it connects the different people that are experts in these tools because it eliminates the interfaces through, for example, connectors uh, that are there that directly can yeah, work with the uh, inputs and outputs of all of these tools. So the working style changes in a way that I work still with my colleagues, but I work on the process on how we get to the uh, product. The satellite company works with designers and, and, uh, and simulation engineers to come up with a complete process. So once I have my input requirements, the complete process runs through and not only the design process, and then it's again a bottleneck of an interface. So connected engineering is really about connecting all of these tools, connecting all these different domains in engineering and these different product development steps that you see today. Yeah, that sounds really good on paper and obviously also in practice because we have some of some or very good case studies actually using this connected engineering approach. But let's be honest for a second, Daniel, what are some of maybe the disadvantages? Because we talked about there has to be a mindset shift in order to adopt something like connected engineering. So what do you think are some of the hurdles and limitations right now at the current stage of connected engineering? So there is, of course, a lot of education needed. Mm -hmm. This is uh, one of the big things. So someone has to implement all of these algorithms. So um, you have to upskill people. Um, you have to teach them how to code. It's also very 
technology dependent. So uh, you have to have a platform that allows you to do all that. And um, for example, some of the tools in generative design in connected engineering are more flexible than others. Um, what you also have is the complexity and the learning curve of what you are trying to do. Because with this specialized knowledge, even when you have it, you're thinking about a process. So thinking about a process is much more uh, complex than thinking about just one part. So the learning mm -hmm. curve is steeper, but on the other hand, the potential that you get out of this is also much, much, much higher. So you need a lot of activation energy in the beginning. Yes. But once you're over that hill, basically, you kind of you get exactly. it. You know how to use it. So um, anything else we might have missed? I think maybe we could spend a, a couple of minutes on topology optimization. So how can people actually use topology optimization inside of Cinera? And maybe be very sp specific and clear that it's not only restricted to generative design. So you can do a ton of stuff inside of Cinera. Yes. Um, so Cinera, I would say, is one of the tools that can um, enable you to do generative design. But with connected engineering itself, you don't necessarily want to do this typical um, uh, the picture that you often see in generative design is like thousands by thousands of design alternatives. And you see mm -hmm. all these, I don't know, drone pictures or whatever. And you say, okay, this is the one that I want to have. In generative design, it's much more going streamlined to the perfect solution. And topology optimization really as a method lends to that because it goes and finds the perfect uh, the perfect um, yeah, structure inside of a design space driven by my requirements. So. In Scenario, we have connectors to several um, topology optimization tools out there, such as OptiStruct or modules uh, like Hexagon Emendate that help you to do this um, topology optimization, even taking some manufacturing constraints into account, such as um, casting constraints or added manufacturing constraints. And there, it's really quite easy. And it's, it falls basically the typical generative design as a, um, process. You define your goals, you define your uh, design spaces, you define input parameters and requirements, and then you just let the topology optimization run through, you reconstruct it, and then you have kind of an optimal design that you need to evaluate. Is it really adhering uh, to all my uh, requirements? And then, yeah, basically you can either iterate or go with this design that you get. Yeah, I think the best way actually for people listening to this podcast is probably to try it. So there's a 14-day free trial of Cinera. So I'm also linking down in the description some of the webinars that we have done with partners in the past, how they actually do topology optimization inside of um, Cinera with kind of manufacturing constraints, etc. Any last closing remarks from you, Daniel, before we wrap up the show? Maybe um, maybe, maybe a view into the future. Maybe if we think about Jarvis, for example. Yeah. What is your vision? So uh, the vision, I think, for generative design or connected engineering for both, it it is growing adoption. Um, so I think as the technology and the platforms and the softwares evolve, generative design will become more accessible, maybe more user-friendly, maybe integrated into standard product development workflows. And then also with the advancements in AI that we are seeing right now, I think, or I believe that uh, generative, generative design will become more sophisticated. And this means that you can tackle much more complex um, yeah, products with gener generative design. And if we talk about vision, the vision of Scenario is always to create this Jarvis, so the AI assistant of Tony Stark and Iron Man, mm -hmm. an AI that you just talk to and that gives you, that helps you, but also executes for you. So is an executive assistant, uh, assistant to designers, to engineers, to come up with whatever you want to create. And uh, that is kind of the vision of connected engineering of um, yeah, generative design to have something that helps you in a way that removes a lot of the manual iterative boring tasks that you normally would do in product development and just lets you, let's say, talk to it or whatever the user interface might be, but um, interact with this AI to come up with the best product possible. Amazing. The future looks bright. So with that, Daniel, thank you so much for kind of introducing us to the world of generative design. And then if you have any more questions, I'll link to Daniel's LinkedIn profile also in the description. So you can reach out whenever you have any more questions. And Daniel is an expert in generative design. And maybe if we can, we also link the link to your thesis down in the description, yes, especially, for, especially for students who might be interested in kind of taking a look. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, Daniel, thank you so much. And um, see you, I guess, in Teams. Yeah, uh, thank you, Yusuf. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.